All right. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, uh, my name is Rob Bunger. I am the uh, Incubation Committee representative for the Data Center Facility Project. Uh, I've been doing OCP stuff for about uh, four-ish years. Um, so uh, very happy to be here. I, uh, my day job is uh, I work within the CTO office of uh, Schneider Electric. Um, so first off, you guys have exceeded my expectations for Friday afternoon in this session, so thank you very, very much for coming. And uh, we're, we're extremely lucky to have a, a panel of experts to go through this. Now, this is the first time the Data Center Facility Group has done a panel discussion. Uh, so we're, we're actually super excited. I like panels because I always tend to learn a lot from the folks that are in the panels. So we'll start off with introductions. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to just let everybody say who they are and uh, introduce them. So we'll, we'll, we'll start off on the left-hand side with uh, Dale. I am Dale Sarger, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I uh, lead the uh, Center for Energy Efficiency and Data Centers. Mike Eady with Facebook, uh, mechanical engineer with our Data Center Strategic Engineering and Design Group. Uh, Russ Lindsay, I'm with Salesforce, and uh, I run data center operations and automation. Uh, Steine Greif from uh, Royal Scoring DHV from Europe, and involved in, uh, as a design engineering consultant in a lot of different data centers, Edge, uh, uh, Cloud, and uh, Otopolo. <coughs> so for me, part of this panel. Yeah, good afternoon, I'm Mike Moore. I'm the uh, regional product manager for Nokia's uh, data center product line called Airframe. Great, all right, thank you very much for being here. To give you some context of this, uh, this panel, so this, the dis discussion of the four principles was uh, an idea that, that Stein actually had and uh, had done a presentation over at the summit in Amsterdam last fall. And uh, he actually came up with the idea of trying to do a panel to discuss uh, some of these things on when you really look at what OCP is trying to achieve, what's, 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 what are the possibilities in the facility side? So uh, we'll just go through a couple of slides before we get into the introduction. And one way you can kind of look at it is the data center facility has really kind of been managed from some standards that are out there. Everybody's familiar with a lot of these things from the Uptime Institute and Bixie and ASHRAE and stuff. Uh, but behind the scenes, with the hyperscalers and a lot of things that they're sharing, there's kind of been what we can call it a hidden standard, but this innovation that's been happening uh, outside of the standards organizations, right? So, you know, a point of discussion is are they still applicable, not applicable? Are there new standards? Do we not need standards? Things like that. Uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the sense of open compute, when you look at the facility, how do you get rid of, um, you know, the stuff that you use 1% of the time? Right. A perfect example is a, a tier four data center, which was, I think, discussed in another session on, uh, you know, the resiliency you get out of that extra lots of money. Um, you know, are there smarter ways we can do things? Do we still need them in today's architectures for cloud and, and edge? And then this is, uh, you know, just a series of questions of, of uh, you know, what ifs, uh, what are the possibilities, you know? Um, you know, can you move applications around? What does that do to the, the facility design? Um, how can you really push the, the physical environment from a temperature perspective uh, and, um, you know, and still operate the data center? So this kind of gives you a feel of the things that we want to discuss in this panel. Now we have uh, some questions. You're not intended to actually read the slide, so don't worry about it. Um, we have some preset questions that we're going to be asking these guys, and uh, we'll let the discussion go where it is. Uh, the best thing about this panel, which I have never seen, I've done lots of, seen lots of panels, uh, is that it's audience participation. So we're going to do a little bit of a test. Everybody should have received a card, all right? So we'll be asking you guys questions. You're going to either answer yes or no. And this is way better than raising hands, because usually when you ask, somebody said, how many people would want this? And how many people want this? And you only get like a third of the people even raising their hands at all. So here you have to raise your card. All right, so everybody show me the green side of their card. A little test. Everybody hold up their arm. Did everybody arms work? All right, good. Red side of the card. All right, we got, we got some problems in the back there. All right, yeah, you got it right there at the end. <laughs> all right, so the people in the back, you'll be getting the opposite of answers of what we'll be seeing, right? So, uh, so we'll, we'll let you know what we say. Um, all right, you guys ready to go? All right, so the first question, what we're going to do, we're going to ask you 
what you think, then we're gonna discuss it, and then we'll ask you again and see if your, if your opinion changed. All right, so the, the, the first question for the audience and the panel, so we'll do the audience here. Would it be acceptable for the design of your data center, or, or one you know, to have a maximum server inlet temperature condition of 35 degrees C, which would be 95 degrees Fahrenheit? Would it be acceptable for you to do that? All right, so everybody show your card. If you think you would do that, show me green. If not, show me yellow. Hold on, on you guys, yeah, all right. Everybody hold your card up. You gotta, you gotta, uh, you gotta hold an answer, you gotta answer. What do you guys think? Is that a 50-50? 60 for? for green. Oh, yeah, yeah. 60 for green, so that's actually encouraging. We're at OCP and I think everybody's forward thinking to see what we can stretch the limits to. So, um, all right, so we'll start off. So I, I'm gonna make it easy. We'll start off on the left-hand side again with, with Dale and just if you wanna make a few yeah, comments about that. Yeah, I thought we were that. just gonna jump to the next question since that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not much of a panel discussion, right? So I mean, for uh, the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, the answer is definitely yes. And our, our latest uh, supercomputer center, which was completed a few years ago, uh, has no compressor cooling. So, so Berkeley does get occasionally temperatures over 100 degrees. And, um, uh, and sometimes the wet bulb temperature, because of the fog patterns and stuff, can be pr pretty high as well. So, so we do experience uh, high temperatures. And we monitor our computers carefully, and they do uh, go to a lower clock speed, and for scientific computing, you know, life goes on. We'll, we'll continue to compute, maybe just at a little slower rate. So for our application, uh, the ability to save all the money that we would have spent on, on a compressor-based air conditioning system was saved, and all the money that we would spend on the, on the operating costs has been saved, um, and, and a few hours a year we might go to a slightly lower clock speed. And real follow up on that question. Does the clock speed just happen automatically at the server level? Like it, it understands its uh, chip temperature and does it automatically or is it something else? I think it's a combination. I mean, I think the, the, there are safeties built into the, the computer that do it, but our, our operators like to have a hand in it. So oh, the operator, okay. We have a very extensive DCIM system that they're, especially on those hot days. And as a matter of fact, I'll tell a little story that day like a year ago where, or, or you know, last summer that was like, you know, I don't know, 108 or 100 and something like that in the in the Bay Area. The the guy that really would have should have made the decision was out of town on on travel, and his subordinate got scared, and they they shut the computer down, which was really unfortunate because we really wanted that story to tell. And in in hindsight, looking at the weather data and stuff, we, we would have made it. But okay. but you know a, you know the humans you know just like grounding the uh, the the jets, we we have to make a decision, and and we took it down Great. gently. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, so I'm super glad to see our head of thermal engineering raise the green card. <laughs> 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 Makes my answers a little bit easier. Uh, you know, 95 degrees is is warm. Um, we're, we're certainly uh, reaching some some critical limits where uh, the servers start to change their behavior, uh, specifically with fan speed. Um, you know, and and depending upon the percentage. The percentage of servers that are have exceeded a, a 95 degree inlet, if we don't have uniform distribution, uh, we could see significant uh, increases in, in airflow demand uh, from the, the servers themselves, uh, where we could get into uh, maybe not thermal runaway, but we could start to see a significant amount of recirculation. Um, so how we look at um, inlet temperatures, how we look at CPU clocking, how we look at airflow um, is, is important. And I'll, I'll second, uh, a second point is we've, I've seen some presentations about the, the challenges of increasing um, heat flux, in, in, increasing uh, CPU uh, and GPU um, power requirements, and that junction temperatures are going, are, the requirements are going down, not up. So as we look at increasing air su supplier temperatures, uh, it's sort of offset by the, the challenges we're seeing from the thermal and hardware teams that junction temperatures and, and the heat problems that they're seeing are also getting harder. Thanks. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll skip past all of the technical bits on this one because I think everybody else is probably going to say the same stuff. Um, the, the part of this that I think is the most overlooked piece is what does that do to your data center technicians? 
right? You have, you have people on the floor who are repairing machines. Um, I, for one, have many data centers around the world with data center technicians who do not like the temperature much above 85 degrees. So, um, you know, I, I don't have a fundamental issue with it from a technology standpoint. I think it's the right thing to do from a technology standpoint to be able to support that. Um, I could see being able to support it for short periods of time. I think it all depends situationally on your locations and, and how long that temperature would be sustained at that level because at some point you have to be able to allow those technicians to be able to get in there and do that work in a way that's, that's not detrimental to their health. Uh, yeah, to add to that, uh, uh, what Dale was always saying, uh, it's, it, it's interesting when you have climates where uh, you can uh, go compressorless and you uh, you work without chillers. Uh, that's not all climates, of course. That's regional. And uh, the inter interesting thing is, from an engineering perspective, uh, there's a lot of fuss around. Uh, OCP equipment is said it can handle 40 degrees Celsius. Not not always, but it can handle it. And the, uh, we are on, the, on the other edge, you have the ASHRAE uh, working with a recommended and an allowable range. And I see a lot of engineering uh, struggles saying it should not go beyond 32 degrees and then they treat it as 32.0 degrees because if you have 32.1 then everything blows up and that, that's not, uh, I think uh, within this community we are open to, uh, to stretch things and uh, not, not for 100% of the time but maybe 5% of the time, uh, 35 degrees, 36 degrees, no one blows up and uh, yeah, that's ma making maybe the, uh, the whole data center uh, as, a, as, a, as a total uh, sustainable, mm -hmm. more sustainable. Yeah. yeah, I think along the human factor, I think there are even OSHA regulations about the oh. amount of time that you can spend at, at certain temperatures. Uh, <coughs> I deal mostly with, uh, with edge data centers and, and far edge. And one of my other jobs, I'm the uh, project chair for the Open Edge project under the Telco project in OCP. And so, you know, when you get farther out toward the edge, those temperature extremes become even worse. You know, you don't necessarily have reliable cooling. And so part of Open Edge, we've actually designed that for 45C, plus 45C, with uh, short-term durations up to 55C. So at least in the unmanned data centers, you know, and, you know, modular container data centers, the, the cell shacks, uh, you know, where, you know, outdoor conditions, uh, you know, we're certainly looking at it going well above 35. Yeah, great. Um, we'll do a quick question. Okay, well, okay. Oh. I just want to, I want to say that some of the servers, many of the cloud servers that I work with have ma maximum recommended temperatures of 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're not asking the server to do anything that's not designed. And second of all, that 95 degrees is an HPU cooling. There are better ways to cool servers that have air conditioning. That's right. Yep. Yeah, that's a great point. So, uh, for the recording, it's hard to hear. Next time, we'll always make get a mic when you ask a question because this is all getting recorded and posted. But it was about uh, servers are pretty good air cooling at 95, but there's other ways to do it with liquid cooling. I, I know that wasn't complete, but uh, you know. <laughs> um, all right, we'll raise our cards again. Any changes? Just to show them all up. We'll give this a go. I don't know if we'll do this for every question, but uh, uh, da, 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 a little bit of change. A little bit of change. People are optimistic about it. I think. You know, and I think the uh, how uh, old data centers versus new versus can you make it all the same type of equipment is going to have a big difference, you know, is, is going to make a big difference on that. So, all right. I'm, I'm just kind of curious for you people that still have the red up, do you work in data centers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, the, the comment was uh, in a multi-tenant co-location, right? You have to uh, kind of look at, uh, you know, all the customers there and you can't have one customer drive it one way. So good, good point. I think it's also worth, worth mentioning that um, air management is absolutely critical uh, to do this. You, you just can't go in and start raising the temperature of your data center without right. making sure that there's a uniform inlet air temperature. So. Um, we shouldn't deal with environmental controls before we've dealt with air management. So just a plug for that. Right. 
Okay. I want to make uh, one addition to the, the comment made is uh, somebody would, should educate uh, the, the users of IT equipment that IT equipment don't blow up beyond 32 degrees. Uh, and that's, uh, yeah, it should start from somewhere. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think also Colos can help in, in spreading the message uh, that way, that we are not in the 2000 anymore. Great. Um, Let's try to do a mic here. Is this uh, working group also in, in talks with the suppliers of uh, OCP IT equipment that they do a proper of tests or a test program, how IT is behaving on higher temperatures, let's say? Is uh, there a link between what you are doing and the IT guys to test to which level they can, can go up? So I would say it's not, the link is not as sophisticated as it could be, but at the incubation committee level within Open Compute, uh, so I hear all the submissions of all the projects, right? Whether it's from the edge, telco networking, and you know, as a facility guy, not that I understand really half that stuff, but that is where, uh, <laughs> that is where a lot of that stuff happens. And so we do get into discussions of how do you, how do you share information across groups, right? Because the, the RAC team might drive requirements to the data center facility, and maybe the data center facility starts putting constraints the other way, right? Yeah, so I think that's a great comment. All right, good stuff. We're gonna move on to the next question. So in the, um, in the realm of like, you know, what are the big chunks of things that you can potentially look CapEx-wise, and are there interesting things to do? This is proposes an idea of, you know, can you imagine operating a future data center, let's say like in five years, just put a time frame on it, uh, with an emergency power generator capacity of less than 80% of the normal operating load. So for example, you kind of look at your data center and say, you know what, I'm only, you know, if there's a power outage that lasts more than the time of my, you know, battery backup, a couple of minutes, I'm really only gonna back up maybe 80% of that load just to save on the capex of, of potentially the long-term uh, energy storage. Would that be possible? I think I have one answer. I saw somebody heads. Uh, uh, yeah, what do we got here? Everybody's got to raise their hand. Everybody's got to raise their hand. Come on, I'm going to wait. There we go. Up high. What do you think? Ah, interesting. 50-50 or a hair more green, I think? Yeah. Okay, good stuff. So we're going to start on the right-hand side with, with Mike. Oh. Uh. I deal uh, mostly with the CSPs, the cellular service providers. So in, you know, they have five nines plus availability standards. And so I don't think any of them would uh, realistically consider cutting back on their backup power. Yeah. Uh, I have seen a couple of customers that will, you know, th they'll save a little money by contracting a company to supply a, a backup generator to their site you know, they'll have one generator there already, but then supply a backup generator to the site for extended outages within like a couple of hours of the event. Yeah. Right, but, uh, and that's how they, they save a little bit of money. But uh, other than that, the cellular service providers, they, I don't think they'd go for it. Uh, yeah, if, uh, from my perspective, if you see the data center as, as, a, as a total, uh, you can say you can run it 80%, and, and when the grid is available, you can it for, uh, run it for 100%. Uh, if, if you have the availability of a, a high available grid, yeah, so you're talking about maybe one outage, maybe no outage a year, uh, yeah, it definitely makes sense to uh, not add N plus two generators to your facility for the 100% load, uh, but, but operate on, uh, on maybe 80%. I, I see a lot of stories these days uh, and in this event of, uh, of very intelligent controllers uh, controlling everything, uh, the, the SSD, the, the BMC, the, uh, no. Uh, so I would say if they tell uh, that controller that they have to run on 80%, they can manage it. And uh, yeah, why not? <laughs> um, so, you know, so I, I'll play devil's advocate, advocate for a second. Um, I, I think no um, for 
certain circumstances, and I think yes for other circumstances, to be honest with you. So um, I think a lot of it really actually doesn't necessarily depend, depend as much on the facility as it does on the software that was written to run in the facility, the SLAs associated with that, with their customers. Um, you know, for us in particular, we have five nines of availability for our customer base. Um, we have, a, you know, we have a DR strategy where we could potentially switch to another facility within a certain amount of time. Um, so we do have some ways that we could accommodate that. But I think in the, in, in the long term, it really depends on the adoption of all of the principles and philosophies associated with being able to support that kind of action. So it's not as simple as I'm just going to cut my data center back to 80% power. It's have I done the other things that allow my service to continue to run and continue to service my customers in a way that they can still you know, be happy with, the, with what service I provide to them. What he said. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I, frankly, I was a little surprised by the uh, the number of, of, of green cards that I saw. This is a, a tenuous discussion that's been going on for a long time. Uh, we may as well throw out high voltage DC and, and talk about that too. Um, so, certainly, the, the software platform is, is the um, is, is the decider on on whether or not this is something that that we can manage. Uh, certainly, the risk can be mitigated by our, you know, utility interconnection and connecting at transmission level and designing your own substations. Um, and however low the probability is that uh, you would see multiple utility uh, interconnections at, you know, 345 kV uh, actually drop, then uh, you, you do need to understand how your business will react and, and be impacted by by the loss of that utility. Um, so uh, it's, it, it certainly is uh, something that uh, I think uh, every major uh, you know, data center owner is, is, is trying to evaluate and understand. Um, generators are um, maintenance intensive, they're expensive, they have emissions, there's regulatory requirements around them. So uh, they do present quite a challenge in siting data centers and the maintenance activities and um, I think everybody understands that uh, a change of state in the data center always leads to um, some some failures. You mentioned even power supplies on the servers when they uh, uh, during a, a change of state, uh, so many will will fail. So a generator is a major piece of equipment that is expected to make a major change of state uh, in just a few seconds. So there, there's risk there as well. So relying on them 100% introduces its own risks. All right, I'll, I'll just mention three scenarios where we, uh, we can basically undersize our generators. Well, it, it's not undersized, it's right-sized. Uh, but the first one is uh, because we are doing scientific computing and we're not, lives aren't at stake, um, we, and we have very reliable electricity. We're served by two substations, so we have very few minutes or hours a year um, that we don't have reliable power. So if we lose power, we have enough generation to maintain our critical services, which is a very small percentage of our total. Uh, the second opportunity has to do with power capping and, and avoiding capital cost and in and, and, and several supercomputer facilities within the DOE complex that's done just to save. We'd rather spend the money on the, on the computer than on the, on the infrastructure. So we'll, we'll power cap and, and again, a few hours a year we might, we might have to implement that. And the third option is, is a DR but not, but not uh, disaster recovery, uh, demand response, which, which means when the utility company is having a problem and, and they would rather have us move, or, or even if there's a, a, an outage on site, we can move the load to another site. And we've, uh, we've proven that. I mean, we've moved our um, uh, load to a supercomputer in San Diego. I mean, so we demonstrated it. Um, but we don't have uh, demand charges uh, or that sort of thing at LBL. So there really wasn't any financial incentive to continue that. But, but that's another uh, example of when the utility is asking you to uh, reduce your load, um, we have that capability to move the load to other data centers. Fantastic. Uh, we will have time at the end also for questions, so if you're not you know, ready right now and something pops up, we'll, we'll make time. Great, so... Well, maybe I, may I have a question then, then for my neighbor here? Uh, I, I heard, uh, I, I attended a presentation of the, uh, uh, you have the, the hyperscale computing, you have the regional edge, and then you have the local edge, but uh, how will be the local edge be backed in power? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's actually something that uh, is getting a lot of discussion nowadays. I, I definitely agree with, with, I think it was Russell or Michael, on your comments about the software being critical. And, uh, you know, the, 
the cellular industry has been transitioning from uh, bare metal solutions, you know, which will really require that uh, that high level of of power availability, to to cloud, and you know, in doing so, you know, when it's architected in a pooled environment, you could actually tolerate, you know, maybe shutting down, uh, you know, certain servers or certain racks to conserve power, if you had that pooled environment set up. Unfortunately. There are some areas where you just don't have that pool of environment available and you need things up all the time. But as far as the, the edge goes, there have been discussions about basically uh, kind of meshing different edge uh, environments together and you know, supplying battery only to those very important components, you know, like the, the remote radio heads and the baseband units, and then shifting the compute over to the adjoining uh, data center. Yeah, okay. edge data center. Uh, the issue with that is, especially as we're moving to 5G, you know, where low latency and high throughput is critical, are you moving it to a data center that still meets the latency requirements demanded by, you know, the applications at the edge? But will be, will be there a generator popped up in every local edge? Right, no, I, I don't think that'll be feasible, yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Good stuff. All right, we'll try the cards one more time for this particular question. Da, 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 da. Come on, everybody raise them. Change your mind, same. All right, yeah, a little bit of change there. Good stuff. All right. Okay, so um, uh, OCP data center facility. Uh, will there be a market in the near future for OCP co-location facilities with NRAC UPSs? And uh, so in the art, you know, as many of you are probably familiar with the open compute rack architecture, uh, one of the elements is a centralized power supply, right, which saves a lot of money from the redundancies that you have in servers. And another aspect is putting your battery backup right there in the rack, which saves on the upstream uh, architecture of large scales UPS and the service associated with that. So for a co-location facility, uh, the question is, and we'll say in the near future, so let's say, uh, let's put a three-year timeline on that. Uh, what, it, what does the audience think? Anybody familiar with co-locations? Uh, give it a guess, just go for it, it's all right. <laughs> There's no wrong answers here. There's no wrong answers. Okay, all right, optimistic crowd, optimistic crowd, all right. We are gonna start with, uh, I'm gonna start with uh, Mike and we'll go this way. Which mic? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Eddie. Uh, so I, I do have uh, some history in uh, a co-location provider. Uh, so I think that the challenge here is um, not about designing and operating and supporting systems that have in-rack UPS. It's um, when people source co-location, uh, typically time is of the essence. There isn't a, a two-year turnaround to say, Let's design it specific for me. I'll have a long-term lease. Um, Co-location leases are often um, shorter-term leases, quicker turnaround, which means that the data center is either built or it is in some sort of construction. Uh, so the, the, the benefit would be simply not installing a UPS and batteries versus installing in-rack UPS. Uh, so I think timing and the, uh, it's a chicken and the egg. Do, are, is there enough OCP hardware going in and enough people asking for data centers that are built around OCP and it's simply not being fulfilled because of time frames? Or will, uh, less, op less optimistic on this manner is, will co-location companies uh, sp speculatively build data centers for OCP? Uh, and that will certainly require a, uh, we, we got to be on the right side of the 80-20 rule, right? You, you build for 80% and you customize for 20. Uh, I think we're on the, the, the flip side of that today. Um, so uh, again, market penetration for OCP and, and, and actual leases that require it will we'll drive that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, I, I agree 100% with that. Um, I, think, I think some of it comes down to um, other potential business strategies that colo facilities may adopt. Um, I don't see necessarily um, a lot of a lot of people coming in and being able to necessarily take advantage of that today, the way that the that the market is. Um, that said, if um, 
you know, co-location provider maybe wanted to do a portion of their facility set up that way. They may even build out, you know, some sort of uh, an in-between model for, for um, cloud providing, right? So rather than saying, hey, I'm going to give you the whole stack and I'm going to give you everything that Amazon gives you or Azure gives you or whoever, I'm not going to give you all that, but I am going to give you a rack full of hardware that you can utilize that's set up, that's optimized for the facility to operate more efficiently. That way they could potentially lower their cost, which means that they might be able to pass a better cost onto their customer. That might be a better model for something like this to actually work out. All right. Uh, yeah, what, what I noticed about walking around, I, I, uh, I saw already three, three flavors in OCP saying we have the batteries centralized, we have the batteries in front of the row, or we have the batteries in the rack. Um, yeah, well, I don't know which decision is made, or will there be a decision in the end uh, made? Uh, I see now on the exhibition here, it's, uh, they put a rectifier in the rack, but not the batteries anymore. So yeah, I mm -hmm. think, is that, is that the new trend of OCP? Is still the batteries going back to centralized? Uh, I don't know, but yeah. Yeah, most of the customers, so, so we actually do deploy OpenRack version 2 to, uh, to our CSP customers, and they typically select that when they want uh, a lot of rack density, right? So when they have the power and cooling to actually accommodate that. And, and given that they want as dense a solution as possible, the, you know, the, the in-rack battery backup basically takes away two OU of, of space. And so, you know, while we've had a few customers ask about it, none have really asked to have us deploy it. Right, I think mostly because they're trying to optimize the compute in the rack itself. Great. Back to you, Dale. I, I'm good. You pass. Pa pa okay. <laughs> I don't know. We didn't set those ground rules when we were not allowed. Um, okay, great. Uh, we'll, uh, audience, any change in your decision one more time? You guys are tired. I could tell. I could look at your face. You're tired of raising your arms on this thing. All right. All right. I'll keep it to just at the beginning next time. Okay, um, so here's another one, and maybe we'll expand this. So again, uh, when you you know power distribution is a is a big expense when you go all the way from uh, you know high voltage all the way down to the rack. Uh, are there uh, you know is power distribution to a row of racks of just a single feed acceptable in large scale deployments? Uh, is that acceptable in large scale deployments? So, uh, all right. Everybody raise your card on this one. A uh, little more yellows. What do you guys think? It's a, it's, it's pretty even. Yeah, it's about 50-50 with maybe a little more of the, uh, uh, maybe not. Um, yeah. All right. So we'll start with Russ in the middle there. <laughs> So um, I'm actually going to say absolutely yes on this one. But I think that that comes down to, again, the comment that I made about making sure that your software stack is built accordingly. Um, if you are somebody who's building large scale deployments, you know, if you're the, you know, the top five guys out there kind of thing, you, you definitely want to be able to have your workload distributed across multiple data centers, across multiple rows in, in the same data center. You, you want to have your deployment done in such a way that you could withstand the loss of a rack or a row or even a data center. So the fact that you have to go into being able to be resilient in that alternate way, I think it by default gives you the, the flexibility to go to a single, to a single power source. Interesting. A follow up on your comment: Is there any like increment you think is appropriate, like uh, you know, uh, well, um, that you'd want on separate feeds? You know, a row, uh, you know, a zone. Um, you know, I, I personally think it's it's by row myself. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's that's reasonable, um, but that, that's just my that's sure. my two cents. No problem. All right, it's time. Yeah. Uh, from the engineering perspective, it's uh, uh, it's known that it costs a lot of money to power every rack with uh, two N feeds, uh, A, B, and uh, if you power f one rack with a, a and B, and then you have distributed redundancy configurations with C, D, E, F, you can play with it, but in the end it comes down from what's 
what's cost effective uh, and and therefore also yeah what's the increment uh, what we are going to is it each every row is it each every uh, pod or or is it just then every rack should be a and then the following b and then the mm. c uh, uh, yeah I'm so uh, I, c I cannot give the answer but I, I'm interested uh, in the, the rest of the opinions yeah. Yeah, I think just like what Russ said, it's highly dependent on the, the software and how it's architected and how much it can actually tolerate uh, you know, a, a row or a, or a rack level failure. Uh, I think it probably the answer is somewhere in between. There, there may be some that require dual feeds if you don't have a good redundancy scheme associated with a good pooled scheme, and then others may be able to get away with a, with a single feed. So I, I'm a big advocate of uh, redundancy in the network rather than redundancy in the data center. So I not only think it should be reconsidered at the at the server or the rack level and row level, but also the data center itself and reconsider the high level and high cost of redundancy, uh, again, in the data center and move that redundancy to the network. Again, where, it's, where it makes sense from a software and application standpoint, re realizing that not every application has that opportunity, but a lot do. Uh, so I had, we, we, all of our equipment is single corded, uh, the vast majority of it. Uh, so the answer for, for Facebook is um, that yes, we're, we're doing it, we do it today. Um, and it, it is, despite being single corded, it, it's, it's quite resilient. So when do we see um, challenges to single cording is, is just like every other event, is it's typically around maintenance. Um, breaker trips and those sort of items are uh, a low risk event, but when we have to maintain equipment, uh, that's where we introduce risk into single corded equipment. Uh, having batteries at the within the rack uh, does permit some flexibility in a, you know doing an open transition, whether manually uh, at busway. It's not it's not a, the greatest method, but if it is possible. Um, so uh, again, it, it, and I think this will be a, a broken record throughout the, throughout the day, is uh, how does the application, how does the business react to um, some increment uh, of, of capacity going offline? Uh, is it a row? Is, is that 20 racks, 50 racks, 100 racks, or 1,000 racks? Um, the business needs to uh, get involved and, and, and indicate um, how much resilient hardware is available to support uh, an outage. Yeah. Uh, can you walk up to the mic? Let's see if that one works. Otherwise, I'll, I'll poorly repeat your question. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask if any of you are operating multi-tier uh, environments where effectively you have dual feeds into the data center and you can kind of plug and play even by rack or, or server the redundancy to, of, of the power of the uh, independent units. I mean, dual dual feeds coming off of a dual-ended bus, you know, so you can you can tap uh, this rack with one feed and this rack with two. Yeah, from a design perspective, you then uh, feed. Uh, I, I imagine that your uh, your visualizer system where every rack can be. Connected to a double rail above it, uh, or one, or one, or or two. Uh, so then you're al already investing in your flexibility, and, f and flexibility is uh, connected to uh, to costs. And, uh, so, yeah. I, I'll add that there's definitely there was a co-location that we worked with that did exactly that, right? So they had two tiers of service that we'd provide customers. So they had the flexibility in the way they set up their power to give them one feed or or two, and they kind of provisioned their power. Just right. You, had, you have to be smart about it so you don't overload when you have a failure, but they, they did that. And you've got to balance them. You have to balance them at the same time, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Any other, uh, any other questions on that? I, I think it's interesting that you, you brought up on um, having that little bit of energy storage right there in the rack gives you some flexibility with regards to switching over maintenance, open transitions, and things like that. Um, concurrent maintainability, in my mind, is, this, is the biggest thing, right? Uh, on, on, you know, will we be, will we live in a world where we could potentially take a zone of the data center, a pod, and migrate uh, applications somewhere else for that two-hour maintenance window that you have to do? Maybe, uh, you know, is is that possible, or uh, or will we always have to have two feeds to keep power 100%? I don't know. Possibility, maybe, maybe in the future. All right. 
Great. All right. We're, we're doing, uh, we are doing well here. Okay. So this is a very broad, broad topic here. It says, um, and this is a question for the audience. We'll start with you guys. Do you guys reference industry, sta industry standards uh, or guidelines uh, in your design, such as Uptime Institute, TIA, 942, BICSI, et cetera. So when you guys are looking at a data center design or even think about how you operate the data center because there's standards around that, uh, do you reference those when you build the data center? So show me a green if you do reference some of those standards. Show me a yellow if you uh, do not. <laughs> it's okay if you don't build a data center, just guess. Uh, that's good. 50-50, uh, more yellows than I kind of expected, actually, in this one. So, yeah, say that again. Oh, cryptocurrency mining, that's a good point, right. Um, all right, so this time we'll start with uh, Stein. Uh, so for the, uh, the reference to the guidelines, uh, the, what uh, the graph was already saying, we, we developed those guidelines with uh, reason. Uh, and the reason of those guidelines uh, was, in my opinion, to, uh, that to tell to the facility developers uh, how to incorporate a REC in, in their facility. So uh, that was the uh, from that perspective. So uh, just uh, what what are the needs of a computer rack? Uh, time is evolving now. Now we are talking about uh, services and applications running, and not the, the rack is not interesting anymore. So uh, you can make it a more high level uh, need. Uh, uh, so translating that back to the what uh, uh, should be in the facility, uh, and can it be written down? Uh, on, a, on, a, on a new way. Uh, that, that's interesting. Uh, here we are at uh, OCP uh, today. And should OCP tell how a data center look like? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, uh, I think that's uh, the data center as a piece it doesn't exist anymore. You have a edge data center, you have a hyperscale data center, you have a colo data center, you have a, a supercompute data center. So uh, there are so many different data centers, it's all about the services they uh, supply. And, and so it's not, not easy to write down how a facility looks. It's, it's uh, flexible. But uh, yeah, I, 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 I understand in the market, there are still a lot of, uh, they rely still on the, a lot of reference to the guidelines. Uh, being aware, not, not so much being aware that it can be improved uh, uh, these days. Yeah, it, at least at the, at the rack level, our customers pretty much demand that we design per NEB standards, right? So GR63 core, GR1089, uh, NEB seismic zone four. Uh, but then at least for the regional and centralized data centers that we sell into, uh, we also have uh, ASHRAE requirements that we basically put back on the customer to make sure that they're creating an environment where our, you know, where our racks can exist. Uh, when we get to the edge, we're kind of going beyond that ASHRAE, you know, temperature and humidity curve. So yeah, I guess for traditional data centers, the answer is yes. Moving toward the edge, it's a, you know, it's a whole new ball game. Yeah. Well, this is an enlightened audience, and I think the reality is. Uh, Old, uh, antiquated specifications are routinely, blindly used in, uh, in the real world. And, and I mean, I see, I recently saw a federal government spec that spec 65 degree, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, that'll be return temperature uh, in a data center. And, and it's like, well, where did that number come from? Well, it came from a previous spec that they probably have used for the last 10 or 20 years. I mean, even today we're seeing specifications that were, made when paper was commonly used in data centers in the form of cards for humidity control, yet those humidity specs continue on today 55% plus or minus 5%. So yeah, there's a lot of blindly used specs that are routinely used that shouldn't be used at all, but, uh, but it's an easy thing to do, to take the old spec and, and you know, put the new project yeah. name on it and issue it. Yeah, everybody's busy, right? Uh, so I'm going to answer this question from, from two perspectives. Uh, the first one um, is, uh, you know, I think a lot of the, the, the basis behind having standards is to make sure that uh, the data center can integrate and work properly with the hardware that sits within it. 
Um, as, as we control both of those, the, the, the standards are set between us and our hardware partners and our software partners and our networking partners. Uh, so we build a data center that's, that's right for Facebook, um, but might not be right for anybody else. Um, taking a, a step back in, in, in some of my history, uh, standards are important, and it, it, it is important to follow reasonable standards and standards that are up to date. Uh, it, but it is the way that you compare, it is the way that you understand if, if, if my off-the-shelf hardware, will it fit in an off-the-shelf data center? Um, the, 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 the power and the temperature requirements for OCP hardware is not dramatically different than off-the-shelf. Uh, I, th I think that's, uh, OCP has driven a lot of the industry to uh, accept higher temperatures, um, warranty to higher temperatures, have uh, wider and varying uh, voltage inputs. Uh, so, I, I do think standards have their place as long as they're properly applied and maybe a, a reasonable sense is put to them. Um, but in the case of, of Facebook, where we control the entire ecosystem, it's not something we require. Okay, I'm going to say I agree with you again. Um, I know, right? <laughs> um, you know, I think it really does come down to you should always reference the the material that's available leverage the experience that's been gained in the past. Um, you doesn't necessarily mean you need to take it and adopt it and use it, but for, for us and for me in my history with this industry, um, it's always best to go back and review those things. You may choose to not do something that's in there for a particular reason, but it's best to, to take a look at it. And I think, I think ultimately that plays back to a lot of the things that we're talking about here with open compute as well, right? You, you have your own particular business, your own particular needs, your own particular deliverable. You may choose to adopt all of OCP standards and go perfectly down the line and do, do everything, or you might need to pick and choose based on your individual circumstance. I, I think that what we've done here with OCP that's really been enlightening and refreshing for the industry is to challenge the things that are written in those specifications and to say, okay, well, why do you use a 19 inch rack, right? It, because, well, you, if anybody know? Yeah, it's because of way back in the day in the, in the telecom space, right? And that's, that's why it was there and that's, that was just something that carried forward because that's what everybody did. Um, this is the opportunity for us to look at those things, take what's good that's still there, leverage it going forward, but also challenge the status quo and be able to say, no, but I would really rather go to, you know, 277 or 480 or whatever input voltage and, you know, challenge those things and, and move, move progress forward in, in the technology we use in our space. All right. Fantastic. Yeah, one, one thing to ask, uh, uh, maybe to you, uh, Robert. Yeah. Uh, uh, OCP was uh, founded in 2011, and that's actually the same year as Azure published this paper. Uh, the last, latest one on the environmental envelope. Uh, things have progressed in OCP. Yeah. Uh, is there a line between OCP and Azure saying, let's let's oh work let's together? Move. Uh, in, in different aspects, in fact, Dale knows this, like even on liquid cooling, there's some good collaboration, right, between ASHRAE and Open Compute, right, um, and the, uh, some of the advanced cooling stuff. So, so I think everybody, uh, uh, there is a lot more collaboration between the industry groups so that we don't have, uh, you know, TIA coming up with one thing and ASHRAE coming up with another and OCP coming up with another and the market kind of ready, throwing their hands up in the air, right? So I think it's getting better. I don't know if that answered your question, but it's my opinion. Okay, uh, we, uh, we're getting right towards the end here. We're gonna do a lightning round. Um, so there's one last question, and this is one of those age old, very age old data center questions. You'll know what I'm talking about here. So the divide between IT and facilities. Is communication allowed between facility stuff and people and the IT to improve overall energy performance of the, the data center facility. So let's see what you guys think, real quick here. It is allowed, ooh. Wow, that's, that's mostly all green. So communication between facility and IT, that is good progress, right? So, so again, we're gonna do, uh, <laughs> I love it. That so, we done that, yeah. 100%. What's that, it was 100%, close? Yeah, yeah, all right. Lightning round, because we only got a few minutes. So quick answers, we'll start with uh, Dale. 
Institutional barrier, not a technical barrier. Yeah. Uh, meaning security in having IT hardware talk with a third party facility mm -hmm. being a horribly challenging security concern that uh, uh, all security teams in IT will, will, will challenge. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think the uh, I think it really comes down to communications um, and people being able to work together and bridging gaps between teams and 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 leveraging the experience on both sides. I don't see any problem, so uh, let's start with it uh, tomorrow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, no, I I think it's a uh, departmental or political issue more than a more than a technical issue. There's ob obvious benefits to it. It's just implementing it that's the issue. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. That's the answer. IT owns the facility. Yeah. Yeah. So two big themes that I got out, right? Institutional issues, which you definitely see, and the security issues with connecting those two systems together. So for a, a, a Facebook data center, then we, we certainly do that. We, 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 the HVAC systems react to inputs from IT. But in a third-party co-location with um, a, 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 a leaseor and a leasee relationship, uh, handing over that data and having that communication uh, is challenging for both sides. Yeah, very good. Okay, before I, uh, any, any other questions or comments on that last question? Okay, so to, to, uh, to wrap it up here, um, uh, one thing I want to uh, bring up is, uh, you know, are you interested in contributing to the data center facility project? Um, this is information that, that's all online, and uh, the great thing I like about, uh, you know, participating in, uh, in open compute is that the threshold to do it is extremely low, uh, right? It can cost you zero dollars to go in and get on the email list, dial in. Most people dial in, listen, right? They're kind of voyeurs there on the call and see what's going on, which is totally great. And then, uh, then they'll start contributing later on. Um, there's a lot of smart people out there, and I think there's a lot of good work that the, uh, the group can do. So a little advertisement for the group. And I'd like to do a big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very much for, for coming here. All right.